President Fisher, Secretary Baker, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. Uh, tonight's event marks the second program of the Baker Institute's new founding director lecture series. The, this series, series is designed to provide a forum for exceptional practitioners in key areas of public policy and to encourage substantive discussion and debate on domestic and foreign policy issues. This evening, we have the privilege to hear from an experienced and insightful expert in the area of economic policy, Richard Fisher, as he concludes his term of nearly 10 years as president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Now, when I called our esteemed speaker and asked him to speak, he said, Ed, I see right through you. You're asking me to speak just before I step down because you could never afford the honorarium I would charge you <laughs> once I'm in the private sector. And that happens to be true because, you know, <laughs> we're self-financed here at the Baker Institute and, uh, you know, I'm Armenian. Uh, during his decade-long tenure, President Fisher has been an outspoken, some might even say iconocla iconoclastic member of the Federal Open Market Committee that sets, as you know, interest rate policy. He is a fierce, and I underscore the, adverb, uh, the adjective fierce, defender of price stability with a flair for colorful figures of speech. He was deeply involved in the Federal Reserve's response to the financial crisis of 2008, easily one of the most important moments in Fed's history. He has been a vocal champion of regulatory regimes and policies which incentivize investment and job creation rather than discourage it, and which stress the needs and practices of those who operate, may I say, in the real world. He has also been a strong advocate at the Fed for increased transparency on how US monetary policy decisions are made and for more clearly addressing and informing the public about these important policy questions. Prior to leading the Dallas Fed, Richard Fisher excelled in both the public and private sectors. He first joined the government during the Carter administration and the Treasury Department before leaving to start successful capital management firms. He rejoined government under the Clinton administration as deputy U.S. trade representative with the rank of ambassador and directed the implementation of bilateral trade agreements, NAFTA, and China's accession to the World Trade Organization. So we are honored to have him here with us tonight to share his insights that he has gained over the course of an outstanding career. Please join me in welcoming President Fisher to our podium. Well, I want to thank the ambassador, because I can't ever pronounce his last name, um, for hosting me here this evening. I am truly honored to be chosen to give my last speech as a Federal Reserve official to the Baker Institute's founding director lecture series. And uh, this is a title that I've decided upon this evening. Janet Yellen is no Mae West. You'll see why at the end of the speech. Uh, I am truly honored to have Jim Baker sitting in front of me. Jim is an institution himself, and he knows that I admire him greatly. Few individuals in the history of our country, I think the only others may be George Schultz, who you served with, and the late Elliot Richardson, have held as many cabinet posts as Secretary Baker. Uh, and few are as loyal a friend. Uh, Jim and I were cabin mates on an elk hunting trip in the high plains of Utah uh, two falls ago. And as you know, he is a crack shot and a very skilled hunter. Uh, we spent the first few hours after we arrived at this campsite practicing it at a range. And while I missed every single shot during practice, Jim effortlessly placed every one of his squarely in the bull's eye at whatever distance was put in front of us. And yet, the next day, 
within an hour of our setting out in a light snow and very bitter cold. On my very first shot, I dropped a big bull that had long evaded his ultimate fate. That bull's nickname, by the way, was Hugh Hefner. He was old, and he always had a dozen or so cows around him at all times. <laughs> and Hugh Hefner the elk had an impressive, wide, six-by-six-point rack. He was a true trophy. I was so proud of myself, my little accomplishment. And I told Jim about it immediately and repeatedly uh, throughout the day. And then over the next two days, uh, Secretary Baker returned without firing a single shot. And he kept saying he just couldn't find anything worth shooting. But I suspect that he held himself back simply to allow me to have my bragging rights for the trip. That's the kind of gentleman that Jim Baker is. Although I feel compelled to tell you, in full disclosure, he did not hold himself back in loudly winning the snoring contest in our cabin. <laughs> so in addition to all his many accomplishments in statecraft in the private sector and his kindness to a neophyte hunter like me, I think that Jim Baker should be on the list as one of the world's greatest snorers as well. <laughs> and on the bragging rights front, I have thoroughly enjoyed my perch at the Fed and particularly my perch in spreading the great story of Texas's economic success. Uh, last Friday, I shared some statistics about our state with an audience in Dallas, uh, like this statistic here. Now, do you know what this represents? It's not the number of likes or followers that your Houston native Beyonce has on social media, although that number might well be of this size. If you place a dollar sign before it, it's the estimated gross state product of Texas for 2014, $1,605,576,000,000. This is the amount that Houstonians and their fellow Texans produced last year, roughly equivalent to the economic output of Canada. And there's been strong momentum building up to that number. Just since I came to my job at the Dallas Fed in 2005, my staff estimates that the real Texas economy has grown by $382 billion, or 36%. And that increment equates to adding more than the entire output of Norway, which is my mother's homeland, and now one of the world's richest nations measured in per capita income. Now, to put Texas in a global perspective, my staff put together this tongue-in-cheap map of the United States that compares the output of each state of the union with an international counterpart. I'm not sure that my friends in Rhode Island, whose wonderful Bryant University awarded me an honorary doctorate last June, will much appreciate their output being compared to that of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or that another cabinet member named Richardson, Bill Richardson, who went on to become governor of New York, will like seeing that New Mexico produces the economic equivalent of Serbia, or that my colleagues in New York will cotton to the same output level as Iran. But there you are. Texas is the second largest economic engine in the country, behind only, only California. But I rather like pointing out that California indeed can be compared to Italy, for unless it corrects its course of overtaxation and regulation, it surely will end up with an economy very much like that of the Repubblica Italiana. So enough of Texas braggadocio, even though it happens to be true. This is my final speech at the Fed. I want to address some of the more pressing issues facing my counterparts on the Federal Open Market Committee in the months ahead, and that's the committee where monetary policy is made for our country. First, it helps to put the size of the U.S. economy in perspective. In 2014, the U.S. produced $17.4 trillion in goods and services. Just since I arrived at the Dallas Fed 10 years ago, the U.S. has increased its total level of real output approximately $2.2 trillion. In sum, the United States is a huge, muscular economy. The real issue is what is the muscle tone of our economy? Where are we presently in terms of growth? And from the perspective of the Federal Reserve's dual mandate of maintaining price stability and providing the monetary conditions to underwrite full employment. Well, here is a simple little dashboard that we use at the Dallas Fed to encapsulate the economy's current condition. The bottom line, as you can see, is that at present, at present, 
Inflation is contained. Unemployment is declining and approaching the level that most economists feel is sustainable without creating inflationary pressures. And the overall economy is steaming along at a growth rate of about 2.4%. Importantly, our fellow citizens are once again feeling more confident about the economy. In an economy propelled by household and business spending, it's helpful to get a grasp on the feelings of the average American consumer. The University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey does just that. And right now, it is telling us that consumers feel better than they did on average from 2002 to 2007. It's been a long time since hope sprang eternal. But 2014 was a huge year for rebuilding consumer confidence. Despite increased consumer sentiment, the US experienced very uneven gross domestic product growth during 2014. This was partly a result of severe winter weather and partly a result of the Affordable Care Act rollout, which disrupted the pattern of household health care expenditures. For the year as a whole, growth looks to have averaged out to be about 2.5%. Now, that may not sound much to you at first blush, but it was enough to give us a 1.1 percentage drop in unemployment rate and the largest job gains since 1999 in the United States. You might not have expected that at the beginning of the year if you had listened to all the gloom and doomers. The musician Prince, or maybe I should call him one of his other names, the artist formerly known as Prince, Joey Coco, Alexander Nevermind, I don't know where he got that one, or this symbol, must have foreseen this when he sang a song called Gonna Party Like It's 1999. So question, are we gonna rock on? Should we look for more of the same in 2015? Or should we be reminded of another lyric from Prince that, quote, parties weren't meant to last, end of quote. And again, we need to put things in perspective. The Wall Street Journal recently published an article that included a chart comparing the level of gross national product, gross domestic product, rather, real terms, adjusted for inflation, in the current expansion without a four prior expansions. In that chart, the current expansion finished dead last, with output well behind what one might have expected based on the economy's performance during the late 1970s and 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. This picture changes markedly, however, if you divide GDP by the available labor force. Then the current expansion is tied with that of the 1990s and edges out those of the 1970s and 2000s. Really, all four of these expansions adjusted, as I've just mentioned, lie almost on top of one another, as this chart shows. Only the recovery from 1981 to 82 recession stands out. The implication is that the weak GDP growth we've seen during the current expansion is largely explained by weak labor force growth. So why has labor force growth been weak? Well, demographics have played a very big role. Population growth has slowed from two and a quarter percent per year in the mid-1970s to one percent today. And more and more baby boomers, young people like me and the good ambassador who just introduced me, and very young people like Secretary Baker, are approaching retirement age. The combined effect of this trend is that growth in the working age population, that's between 16 and 64, has slowed to just one half of one percent per annum. In addition, a higher proportion of young people are attending college than in the past. And the huge flow of women from the home to the workplace has largely run its course. The recession of 2008-2009 undoubtedly pushed many people into premature retirement. It's doubtful, though, whether enough of them can be brought back into the job market at this point to move the participation rate appreciably higher. In sum, the labor force growth has been anemic because of slow growth in the working age population and because for reasons that have nothing to do with monetary policy, the labor force participation rate for those of working age has stopped rising and started trending downward. Labor force growth is likely to remain anemic over at least the next couple of years. And with the working age population growing at only one half of 1% per year, the dividing line between a rising and a falling unemployment rate is less than 100,000 jobs per month for any realistic assumption about labor force growth. The point is that economic growth at the pace we saw in 2014 will quickly drive us to and past 
the five to five and a half percent unemployment range regarded as sustainable by most policymakers and private analysts. In fact, a repeat of 2014's performance would put us at around four and a half percent unemployment by year end 2015. The sustainable, or in Fed speak, the natural rate of unemployment varies over time with changes in educational attainment and demographic composition of the labor force. At any one point in time, estimates are subject to considerable uncertainty. We have to be constantly alert to the possibility that current estimates are mistaken. Still, given the dangers associated with overshooting full employment, I believe it behooves monetary policymakers, my colleagues, to be cautious. With all the benefits of hindsight, the Congressional Budget Office estimates the natural rate of unemployment has averaged 5.6% and has never fallen below 5% in the United States going all the way back to 1948. Some commentators point to subdued wage growth as evidence that substantial labor market slack exists and remains. Taking policy cues, however, from present wage growth would, in my opinion, move us into dangerous territory. Slack responds to monetary policy with a lag, and wage growth responds with a lag to slack. So current wage growth is a very backward-looking measure of policy stance. Moreover, research conducted at the Dallas Fed has demonstrated that wage growth's response to labor market slack is highly nonlinear. The response gets stronger and stronger as the slack diminishes, as one might expect. The gradual increase in wage growth that we've seen to date is entirely consistent with historical experience once lags and non-linearity are taken into account. The red lines in these two graphs, and I'll have to walk you through them, you have to look at them for a minute, will show you how we tracked from the beginning of 2011 to the end of 2014, that's the red line from right to left, in terms of wage growth detrended by inflation expectations, that's the vertical axis, related to the declining unemployment rate, the horizontal axis, and then where we were, uh, and then where we think we will be at the Dallas Fed at the end of 2015. Some highly respected observers would have the Fed wait and see until, we, in the words of Larry Summers, see the whites of the eyes of full employment, end of quote before we start raising interest rates or shrinking our $2.5 trillion bond portfolio. Would pushing past full employment really be so bad? And so what if inflation rises temporarily above target? Can't we do an after the fact course correction if it should turn out that policy has been too accommodative? Well, there's certainly something to the argument that it's okay to go off your diet from time to time, especially if your weight's been running below target. But my view is you can't consistently binge without getting into trouble. Sooner or later, you have to take measures to bring your caloric intake back to normal, lest your weight and your waistline balloon and your health deteriorate. In the monetary policy sphere, unfortunately, cutting back has proven to be even more difficult than it is in personal weight control. In the real world, one never sees the smooth moderately sized unemployment increases that our simple mathematical models so readily generate. A recessionary dynamic kicks in whenever the unemployment rate rises by more than a few tenths of a percentage point persistently. The problem with overshooting full employment to any significant degree is that it has always set the stage for a recession. Gaining weight, reducing the unemployment rate is easy. Attempts to lose weight, that is to stem overheating the economy, seems always to get out of control and lands us in the hospital. Every time in its history that the Federal Reserve has tightened monetary policy after achieving full employment, it has driven the economy into economic recession. It's because of this dynamic and my desire to prolong the current expansion that I have argued that we should begin reducing policy accommodation earlier than many of my colleagues on the Open Market Committee appear to wish. There's every indication that solid above potential growth in employment and output is going to continue through the summer of 2015. The unemployment rate is likely to reach the bottom of the range of so-called natural rate estimates within that time frame. 
So if we're serious about limiting full employment overshoot, I posit that prompt action to scale back accommodation is likely to prove imperative. The idea that we can substitute a steeper future funds rate path for an earlier liftoff seems very risky to me. I'd rather that the Open Market Committee raise rates early and gradually than late and steeply. The credibility of a later and steep policy strategy is suspect, it seems to me. Isn't it possible or even likely that the public will interpret a decision to defer liftoff as a signal that the committee is generally dovish and generally disinclined to raise rates? In other words, mightn't the public see the choices between earlier and gradual and later and gradual rather than earlier and gradual and later and steep? I have felt that were we to begin liftoff, and by the way, I've been eager to use the term liftoff in this town for some time, especially with Ellen Ochoa, the director of the Johnson Space Center and a chair of the Houston Branch Board of Directors of our Federal Reserve Branch here in Houston sitting right in front of me. But I have felt that we should begin liftoff earlier, earlier in 2015, that markets would then have more confidence about the gradual in earlier and gradual. Otherwise, as some of my colleagues have publicly stated, if we were to defer liftoff until, say, December 2015, but then plan to raise rates quickly thereafter, people would have to wait until sometime in 2016 to determine whether they were serious. Early and gradual is quickly verified. Later and steep requires a high level of trust. It's certainly no stretch to think that the public might not completely buy into the steep in the later and steep argument. And what about the incentive to renege? January 2016 arrives. Suppose the public has, in fact, not bought into the FOMC's promise of a steeper fund rate path. What if the Fed surveys of market operators and dealers reveal that financial bets and commitments have been made such that a move to raise rates appears likely to incite financial market turbulence? Might future policymakers then be strongly tempted to back down? Well, as you may know, in the aviary of central bankers, I am known as a hawk, even though I really haven't spoken about the threat of immediate inflation since 2008 when we had an inflationary scare just before the legs were pulled out from under the table by the failure of Lehman Brothers and the collapse of the financial superstructure. So you may wonder how I view that the current minimal inflation or even deflationary pressure that some commentators are worrying about aloud. The Open Market Committee is trying its level best to understand the dynamics of inflation. We've declared a 2% intermediate target for inflation, which seems to be the standard for most central banks internationally. Headline inflation measures show a significant shortfall from that target. The headline personal consumption expenditure price index, for example, fell 0.5% in January. Its 12-month increase was just 0.2% down from 1.6% in June. Should this low and still falling rate of headline inflation retard the date of liftoff from the zero interest rate policy we've been operating for more than six years? Well, I think not. Especially here in Houston, folks know that headline inflation is being held down by a big decline in energy prices that began in the second half of 2014. But we should also know that once energy prices stabilize, or if they just don't keep going down, headline inflation is likely to bounce right back up. Policy needs to take past inflation into account, but it needs to take future inflation into account also. For policy purposes, it is inflation's medium-term trend that matters. And that's why in evaluating progress towards our price stability objective, I pay close to zero attention to realized headline inflation. I pay nearly as little attention to conventional core inflation, which excludes food and energy prices. I much prefer the Dallas Fed's trimmed mean core inflation measure, which each month excludes the most extreme upward and downward price movements, regardless of their source. And this graph shows you the current trend of both headline and trimmed mean inflation. The trimmed mean inflation, of course, would be the blue line. A good core inflation measure strips the noise out of headline inflation and it leaves the signal. The trim mean inflation rate has so far held pretty steady in the face of this drop in energy prices and the appreciation of the dollar.
It would not surprise me to see a slight decline in the trim mean rate as we did last month in the near term, but I think the decline is likely to be temporary. The inflation trend should reverse later this year, assuming that energy prices don't fall further and that the, the dollar somewhat stabilizes. Now, if you go to the Dallas Fed website, you'll see our most recent posting. The 12-month trim mean slipped slightly to 1.5%, just below the range of 1.6 to 1.7%. It's occupied every month since April of 2014. It's a little bit lower than what the committee has been shooting for, but it's a whole lot less discouraging than the headline inflation reading of almost nil. At the end of the year, trim mean inflation is more likely to be above its current 1.5% trend rate than below. Well, that's probably about all the serious, however I hope it, well-interpreted Fed speak you can handle in an evening. So perhaps I ought to leave you with a few simple takeaways. The U.S. economy is improving. We're approaching any sensible measure of full employment. And even though the numeric inflation target for the intermediate term has not been reached, we have reasonable price dynamics that are unlikely to threaten further economic growth and continued job creation for the nation as a whole, as long as the Federal Open Market Committee doesn't flinch from beginning to normalize policy on a timely basis. But we'll see. In a recent speech to the Economic Club of New York, I quoted Mae West, and she said, I generally avoid temptation unless I can't resist it. <laughs> well, I think I'm safe in saying that Janet Yellen is no Mae West. I, as you can see, I leave the Fed with high expectations that she will be ably able to lead the Federal Open Market Committee down the path of normalizing monetary policy and resist any temptation for too long that path-changing task that she has to lead us through. Ed, I want to thank you for letting me speak here tonight. I thank the people of Houston and all of Texas for allowing me the incredible privilege of serving for a decade as president and CEO of the 11th District's Federal Reserve Bank. The past 10 years have been challenging. They've also been immensely rewarding. Indeed, in my farewell letter to my staff, I suggested that given the crisis we went through, the life of a Fed president should be measured in dog years. So I thank you all very much for letting me lead the Dallas Fed for the last 70 years. Thank you very much. Good night. God bless you, and God bless Texas. And I suppose I should conclude, Ed. Yeah. In the true tradition of central banking, I'd be happy to avoid answering any questions that you have. <laughs> we are going to have a question and answer period. There are two microphones in the aisles. Uh, please ask a question and do not give a speech. Uh, we have a keynote speaker tonight. So if you just go to the uh, microphones if you have a question. I'm going to start it off by asking our uh, distinguished speaker a tough question. How do you plan to clean up the Fed's balance sheet of $4.5 trillion of debt? Well, let me put this in perspective. When I started this job 10 years ago, our balance sheet was a little over $800 billion, between $800 billion and $900 billion. Uh, and then the crisis came, and we followed the playbook that was written in 1825 by, and documented by a man named Walter Badgett. This is a playbook written by the Bank of England. We opened the sluice gates, we let the money flow. And that was because the markets failed. There was no trust. Banks didn't trust each other to lend money. You may remember the first money market fund in the United States broke the buck. The commercial paper market evaporated everything ground to a halt. Without money, you can't run the engine of the United States economy. You cannot have commerce. And so we put together an enormous set of emergency programs under exigent circumstances. They worked. Uh, and we didn't lose a dime, uh, particularly if you measure it um, in terms of the great risk that we took. That was the easy part. And I should tell you that none of us on the Open Market Committee slept through one night for 18 months. We either had a conference call or we had concerns of whether or not we had given the right advice and what tools we were going to use. We cut interest rates to zero. I voted against that. 
I thought interest rates of 2% or so were sufficient to regenerate the economy. And I worried very much about the pressure it put on the margins of banks, in particular the community banks, uh, but also the large banks as well. Once you reach zero, so-called zero bound, the only way to put money into the system is to buy things. And we are allowed by law only to buy U.S. Treasuries and agency-backed securities of the U.S. government. So that's Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and Sally Mae. And boy, we went to work. So our balance sheet today is four and a half trillion. Uh, and in buying those securities, of course, when you buy something, you pay for it. We bought it from depository institutions, put money out into the system. Now, the issue is that they've put the money back to the 12 Federal Reserve Banks. And I want to remind you, the Board of Governors exists in Washington, D.C. And like most things in Washington, D.C., they don't run anything. They run at the 12 Federal Reserve Banks. We run the system. And those people we paid for the bonds put the money back to us. So sitting on our cumulative balance sheet of our 12 Federal Reserve Banks is presently a little over $2.5 trillion of excess reserves. Excess means it's not being used. That's above the required reserve levels of banks by law. Under an act of Congress, we pay 25 one hundredths of 1%, 1 25 base points per annum uh, for that money. And every woman and man I know who's a banker would rather be lending it out at 4 or 5 or 6%, but it's sitting fallow on the balance sheets of the 12 Federal Reserve Bank. And the real issue, Ed, is what happens if the velocity of that money going back in the economy when it starts to go back in, how rapid that occurs, and will it create inflationary pressure? And just to put that number in perspective, these aren't the days of the old Federal Reserve. And when Paul Volcker was chairman, only the depository institutions really were the short-term money markets. Now we have private equity groups and we have huge amounts of corporate holdings of, non, in other words, non-depository institutions. So you need to take that two and a half trillion and multiply it by five to understand how much liquidity there is sloshing around in the hull of the ship of the American economy. And that is explosive fuel. So the answer is very gingerly and very slowly because by virtue of building the balance sheet to the size we did, we created this potential inflationary tender. And the real trick will be adjusting the flow back into the economy and the signals we send to the marketplace. And that's going to be a very difficult, difficult thing to do. And I would say that I'm in that way very pleased that my tenure at the Federal Reserve is coming to an end. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Unless I was reading your chart wrong, the wage data looked pretty discouraging. How much can the Fed influence that? Well, um, what we do influence is overall demand. Let me use the simplest analogy I can, so I explain things to myself. We provide the gasoline for the engine of the economy, and we have filled the tank and it's brimming over. Uh, someone has to be incented to step on the accelerator. So you ask how much influence we have. It only works if people step on the accelerator to move the engine or car of the economy forward. And there is where your wonderfully elected representatives in Washington come to play. We've had terrible fiscal policy. We've had no fiscal policy to speak of. And we don't even know what taxes will be after the year fiscal year 2016. Uh, we don't know what the spending patterns of government are going to be. If you're a woman trying to plan a business, you're dealing under conditions of almost total uncertainty. You know that the fuel is there. You've fixed up your balance sheet. You've bought back in shares with the cheap money we made available in the bond markets through the Fed. Uh, and you've increased your dividends, but you want to grow your top line earnings. That requires capital expansion. And yet you're not sure what the tax treatment's likely to be. Nor are you sure of how federal government spending patterns, which are important in our society, because they do have an impact, are going to run. Uh, and then lastly, you are burdened with excessive regulation, a regulatory system that is cumulative and additive and never subtractive. So uh, the answer is we don't have full control over this issue. Now, as to wages themselves, they're also determined by skill sets. And therein you get to other issues which are out even from the purview of fiscal policymakers. As you know, our education system is not the best in the world particularly K through 12, and we have a huge skills mismatch. Uh, 
and it, it is across the board. We have a shortage of truck drivers, for example, in America. I was talking about this earlier with some students. It, as Harry Truman said, by the way, there's an organization for everything. You call someone a jackass, the jackass lobby gets on your back. Well, there actually is a truck drivers association. We are 20,000 truck drivers short in America. They expect us to be 200,000 truck drivers short, in part because we haven't lived up to our commitments in NAFTA. Well, how do you equilibrate that shortage? Through prices. And if you look at what truck drivers are being paid, they have very high wage acceleration right now. Go to the other extreme, which is auditors, an odd category. We have a low supply of auditors in the United States, and we have a low supply of high-tech engineers and so on. So there are price disparities in different sectors. The, the question is the aggregate. And if you looked at those little red lines, we're actually slowly beginning to see uh, price of wage increases running above the rate of inflation, or at least inflationary expectations. And we would expect that as we go through time, we want to see wages rise, but we also want to make sure it doesn't rise to the point where it propels inflation overall and it gets out of hand above our 2% target. Thank you. And I would just as soon see the freight move by rail. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay on the same thing theme. Um, you talked about the relationship between wages and unemployment. Walmart the largest private employer in the right, U.S. Right, right, just right. raised wages from $8 an hour to $9 an hour. And I assume that will rip, ripple up in their ranks and also affect related industries of lower skilled workers. Do you pay attention to that? Does the Fed pay attention to that? Is, and is that a non-parallel shift in wages that you talked about? We do. And we, we, uh, I particularly pay attention to this. These are signs. The Walmart's not the only company that's doing this, by the way. Uh, they also might be doing it for a different reason because there is this effort to mandate minimum wages state by state. Uh, and there seems to be some political impetus behind this in this current administration. I won't make a judgment about that, but it's just an observation. I think by making the observation, I gave you my judgment, because um, <laughs> I'm a believer in a free market. But um, what I do before every open market committee meeting is I survey a group of some 50 CEOs of large, medium, small companies, publicly and privately traded around the country, not just in my district. We are very blessed to have so many Fortune 500 companies and so many great entrepreneurs right here in the 11th Federal Reserve District, which is 98% Texas. My district is 98% Texas, a sliver of Louisiana, northern, what we call the productive parts of Louisiana, northern Louisiana, and then southern New Mexico. Uh, but I survey CEOs from around the country. And uh, I'm beginning to hear a little bit more about uh, price pressures on the shop floor. Even though manufacturing is only 12% of our output in this country, we're a service-driven economy. And more and more pressures in the high value-added skill set area. And I think that's where uh, we're, we're likely to see as the economy expands. And because we are the epicenter of global economic growth here in the United States now, uh, further pressures as the unemployment rate comes down. There's a direct correlation between the two, uh, and that's what I expect to see over time. But what I do is I survey these CEOs. I usually get to about 32 of them before every meeting, and I relate to my colleagues when I'm hearing from what I call my interlocutors. Now, serious PhD model building econometricians don't place a lot of weight on anecdotal in input. I think it's very important to understand the micro. Because remember, many micros make a macro, right? right. So uh, listen very carefully and just report that to the committee. I always say for what it's worth. But if you read through the transcripts the last several years, I've been doing that constantly. And I think it's hopefully of some value. They're Thank sending you. a signal. Yes, sir. How do the millions of um, illegal and undocumented people in the country impact the unemployment numbers? Um, well, I'm going to stay away from the politics of, of immigration. And you asked me about the economics of immigration. And uh, I should also, truth in advertising, I'm the son of immigrants. By the way, we all are. I don't see, are there any Native Americans in here? Oh, thank you. OK, good. So. Um, I think the important point is the following. Uh, if we have labor shortages and skill sets in certain areas, we can fill them by immigration. And it keeps a healthy economy. It also helps 
a growing economy. One of the most interesting sub-facts of what's happened in the employment sector is the Hispanics have had the greatest employment gains in the current recovery. Uh, as you may know, almost all homes in America are built primarily by Mexicans, but also by Costa Ricans and other Hispanics. 700,000 Hispanics lost their jobs in the construction industry during the recession. They now are at higher employment levels than they were before the recession started. It's the only ethnic group of all of our ethnic groups, including whites and including blacks, that have surpassed their previous employment levels. Well, a lot of those are immigrants, or had been immigrants so at least a generation or maybe half a generation ago. Uh, but they're providing a skill that just cannot be provided or is not provided uh, by native domestic Americans. So I would argue that immigration, well managed, is a constructive force in our society and not a destructive force. And as to the temperament and emotional arguments about immigration, I won't go down that path. But economically speaking, it gives us a resource if we can't fill that space with what we have available with our domestic skill set, then we're gonna to have to bring it into this country. And I think it's a positive from an economic standpoint. Thank you. Thanks very much for your visit and speech here today. Um, as I understand it, the original Fed mandate was a single one, which was price stability, and at mm -hmm. some point it changed to a dual mandate, price stability and un low unemployment, low uh, high unemployment. Um, do you think that's had, that second mandate uh, has had a um, coloring or diluting effect on the, on the initial mandate? Yeah, that mandate came uh, through the Humphrey Hawkins legislation. Remember, we're given our license by Congress. Under the Constitution, Congress has the right to coin money. But knowing their better instincts or their worst instincts, they give that privilege, essentially, electronically speaking, to generate money to the Federal Reserve and lets us operate with independence. Um, so um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the specifics of your question. Repeat it. W would the Fed be off be better off having right, with a, single a single mandate, mandate. as opposed well, to Well, the dual mandate's in place. Um, as I just tried to explain to you, there's a correlation between full employment or overshooting full employment and inflationary pressure. That's what the so-called Phillips curve is. and. Um, I wasn't in favor of the dual mandate uh, because, again, I think so much of the responsibility for achieving full employment lies with fiscal and regulatory authorities. We do know, as Milton Friedman taught us, that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. Uh, and yet, at present, I would think we'd still be having the same debates if we had a single mandate. There's a third part of the mandate that nobody talks about because the way the law is written, it calls on us to maintain price stability, create the monetary conditions for achieving full employment, and for maintaining um, interest rates at a moderate level. You're pretty hard stretch right now to think interest rates are at a moderate level. We've squeezed the yield curve down so the 30-year bond is yielding less than 3%. And that's what I am personally deeply concerned about. We twisted the yield curve that we artificially influence these low interest rates. There are benefits that were had and there were costs that were involved. Those people that saved money and worked hard, accumulated their savings, particularly older guys like us that moved into the yield curve, uh, became more conservative, those people took a hit. The benefit was that you changed the discount rate on cash flows and earning rates by cutting rates to zero and corporate stocks have gone through the roof. That's the good stuff. But anyway, I, I, I think there are cross currents here. And I'm not sure we'd be conducting policy much differently if we didn't have the second mandate. But one thing I do know is that interest rates are not moderate at present. And things revert to the mean. The question is what will be the cost of it going back to the mean and how quickly do we get there? On your answer to the ambassador's question, you referred to the enormous amount of excess reserves that are on deposit with the Fed. How effective do you think that the interest rate on those reserves is going to serve as a policy tool? And to what extent do you think that raising reserve requirements would help you prevent an enormous sudden outflow of those reserves? Well, these are some of the tools we can put to work. We pay interest on those reserves. It's called IOER, interest on excess reserves. Uh, I want you to think about the space that's required here. We now pay, as I said earlier, 25 basis points per annum. Uh, 
25 one hundredths of one percent per year. Um, think about a banker that has that money on deposit with us, and she may want to lend it out to a creditworthy customer where she can get four to five percent. That's a big gap. Uh, and then, of course, we have the ability to pay for longer-term deposits. We've set up a facility to do that as well. But that's a big movement. Normally, uh, the nominal interest rate is 2% or so above the underlying rate of inflation. So if you assume that we achieve a 2% target, that's we're talking 4%. So we've constructed a toolkit. We have the ability to move the Fed funds rate. We have the ability to deal with what we pay for excess reserves in order to retain some of it and not have it flow so much out into the economy. We also have created a complex structure of operating a, uh, a repo market, a reverse repo market. I don't want to bore the audience with that one. Uh, but we've got a little toolkit that we put in place. And the real question is, will it be sufficient? I actually think it is a very good toolkit. But in the end, it'll all come down to whether people want to borrow money, have the desire to uh, lend it as bankers, and how quickly that money will flow out. Every increment you increase, the amount you pay, obviously you're going to keep a little bit more on your books. But I, I do think this is the real question of our time. Um, and as I like to say, this is a Shakespearean drama. We had this big storm, and we tied Ben Bernanke to the mast, and we avoided the sirens, and we sailed through this incredible uh, disaster that was on hand. And then we reached some fairly smooth waters. Uh, but the story's not over. In my book, this is a five-act play, and we're only through maybe three and a half or four acts. And we won't know if this is a tragedy or a comedy until the fifth act is completed, and we won't know that for quite some time. And we won't know that until we really find out what happens to all that excess money that's on our balance sheet. Could be the last question. Uh, most of us are uh, besieged by pitches to buy gold or other precious metals as a very conservative investment. What can you say positive about, I guess, American full faith and credit and the American economic engine as a whole to try to ally uh, fears like that? Well, this is a... Uh, I like to say we have a faith-based currency. And uh, you have to ask yourself what the alternatives are. And, and actually, I think this is an important point for all of us to realize. Uh, when Secretary Baker and George Shultz and President Reagan and others were negotiating the end of the Cold War, we had grown up in an environment of mutually assured destruction. And I remember very well when we moved back to the United States, I grew up in Mexico, we would run these little drills in school where we'd crawl under our desk in case we were attacked, as though that wouldn't be our demise by being fried by a nuke launched by the Russians. And then we'd run to the bomb shelter. Uh, that was my generation. The wall came down. Mao died. Russia has changed, although we're not sure exactly how. But the Soviet Union evaporated. And we used to deal with uh, a G6. I like to say now we deal with a G whiz. We got so many Gs, it's hard to believe. Group of 20, group of 30, group of 40, et cetera. The point is we've gone from mutually assured destruction to mutually assured competition. And markets are working worldwide. And right now, the way the markets are working is an expression of great faith in the American dollar. I must say I got sick of people saying Japan would take over the world. Or Professor Kennedy at Yale, a junior college in New Haven, Connecticut, um, was this is a harvest man. That's right. Uh, arguing that Europe would supersede the United States. And then, of course, we've had the great China fear. Uh, we're number one. We are the epicenter, North America, Canada, Mexico, and the United States, of economic growth in the world. And this is a matter of confidence. And right now, the US dollar is at a premium. We're trading at 106 on the euro. At least we were last night when I went to bed. Uh, so. Um, it is faith-based. It is a paper concept. As to gold, um, some people call it a barbaric relic. It's a question of the amount of supply. And uh, it's a question of what you really ultimately have confidence in and what you can store and afford to store. But I, I do think you have to remember that 
gold or any other commodity operates like a commodity, and that is like a security, it is driven by manic depression. And it's a manic depression market, as stocks are. People get excited one day, wake up, and say, geez, the world looks great, I wanna own it. Or in the case of gold, the world looks awful, I wanna own it. But you can trade it out, and what's it denominated in? Dollars. That's how you realize your gain or your loss. So I wouldn't give up on a paper currency. It's the nature of our system. Our job is to manage it so that it doesn't lose its value. And the best way for it to be destroyed, and Lenin wrote this more articulately than anybody, is to destroy it through inflation and debasement. So we should have a limited supply, well managed, and again, one of the tasks to making sure we maintain our value will be how we reduce that balance sheet that we've constructed in order to save our economy. This Thank you. This is going to be the last question, but so and we all know, Judy Lay Allen is going to ask a question, <laughs> which I have to say historically would be an anomaly if she did not ask a question. No. In a financial economic lecture. I'm going to violate your rule. you Because this is not a question. It is to say that 10 years ago, I was one of the five people on the nominating committee to choose the next president of the 12th district. I even asked the first question, and he answered it so brilliantly that we all took a deep breath and almost immediately knew this was our guy. You have made all of us on the board at that time look brilliant. And Richard, Godspeed into whatever you do next. You have made the 12th district a shining star in the Fed system, and we will always be indebted to you. You have done a superb job. Thank you, Judy. Perfect ending. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. I was just prepared for that.